Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, welcome to our, our first live virtual cabinet meeting of Newport City Council. So thank you all for um, participating in our meeting this afternoon. And I'd like to welcome all those members of the public who are viewing this live, or those members of the public who will be watching the recording later. Welcome everyone. We'll start with item one on our agenda, which is apologies, and uh, we haven't received any apologies for this meeting. Are there any declarations of interest? No, thank you. Item number three on the agenda are the minutes from our cabinet meeting on in June. Are colleagues content with the minutes? And um, if you are content colleagues, could we please um, move that they are a true record? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Thank you. Everyone content with that? That's great, thank you. We move on then to item four um, and the business of our agenda today, which is the revenue outturn. You can find this in pages 15 to 48 of your packs today. This report details the final outturn position of the authority for the financial year 2019-20 that ended on the 31st of March 2020. It's important to note that 2019-20 was not significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic as lockdown didn't come into force until the latter end of March when the financial year was closing. Therefore, there was very little impact on the council finances for that financial year. In relation to the outturn, overall, the financial, the financial year can be seen as a positive outcome as the council managed within its overall budget and the revenue outturn so shows an overall underspend of two million pounds. As we go through the paper, colleagues, Cabinet will be asked to approve um, how this underspend is utilised. And at that point, before I go through um, in any greater detail, I really would like to thank um, our heads of service and our officers for their, their really prudent financial management during this um, financial year. We are facing increasing pressures all of the time, and I do thank you all for the efforts that you've made in relation to this. I'd like to just highlight some key movements and some of the main variances in, in the paper. There's a number of key movements uh, between the position that was reported in January and where we are at year end. And overall, the underspend increased by 377,000, largely because of um, service areas overspends decreasing specifically in the demand led areas of social care. However, we did see this offset in a lower underspend reported across non-service. In terms of the main variances, there's been a consistent message throughout 1920, 1919-20 about uh, significant overspending within a few key areas. And this proved to be the case when we reached the year end. There are three key areas of overspending which contribute 2.1 million pounds of service area overspending and this relates to adult social care community care which is a sum of 955,000 pounds children's independent fostering 598,000 pounds and children's out of area placements 553,000 pounds and i think it's important to note colleagues as we go through this paper that these overspends relate to statutory service provisions so these are services that we are legally required to provide as a local authority and we have no control over the demand for these services however we were able to mitigate the overspends through use of um, the 1.4 million pound contingency and some underspends in an, a number of areas and this includes capital financing, the council tax reduction scheme and council tax surplus, as well as a number of areas that are underspent. It's very important to note that this pattern of overspending in service areas has occurred for a number of years. 
And due to reduction in budgets in some of the non-service areas and demand pressures on CPRS and council tax arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, non-service underspends may be unable to mitigate overspends in future years. So just highlighting that colleagues, that whereas before we might have had a degree of flexibility, clearly this year in this most unprecedented situation, this financial year, the cost of our response to the COVID pandemic combined with the challenges that we experience around our revenue income streams means we'll have little flexibility in the way that we have had in previous years. And so it's important that I share with you in relation to this, that the head of, of finance recommends that the senior leadership team puts in place a robust specific monitoring process with the social care management teams to review financial management detail, issues in detail. So this is something that we need to monitor closely because we're aware that the year that we're currently in is going to be um, most, most unprecedented. I turn to the school's position. As schools variances are covered by the school's balances reserve, the overall underspend of two million does not include the school's position. For 1920, schools overspent by two million, with the secondary sector overspending significantly. And what this means, colleagues, is that total school reserves have fallen from 3.1 million to 1.1 million. The position at individual school level is very challenging with 67% of secondary, 12% of primary and 50% of special schools being in nil or deficit balances. Of particular concern to us is the secondary sector with five schools with in-year overspending of between 175,000 and 328,000. And one of these schools having a deficit reserve in excess of one million pounds. Schools reserves are likely to reduce further in the current financial year unless action is taken to reduce costs. With the challenge being that the reserve balances are not available to offset overspending to this level in future. With this, in this context, colleagues, we're reminded by the head of finance that other council budgets and reserves where unallocated or committed will be needed to subsidise or augment school reserves if they fall in overall terms beyond nil and into a substantial negative balance. And there is no plan to recover this in a reasonable timescale. That means that a key priority now is to see what the reserve position is planned to be. And medium term financial plans incorporate in de deficit recovery plans to assess the longer term trajectory for school reserves. Again, the head of finance, in this finance is recommending to us that the council senior leadership team puts in place a robust specific monitoring process within the education management teams to review financial management issues in detail. So we've highlighted there, um, colleagues, the two service areas where there is most pressure and uh, where we are most likely to experience overspends in the forthcoming year. And um, as I've highlighted, during the course of the presentation of this paper, we will need to ensure that this is monitored very carefully. Considering the utilisation of the underspend and reserves, um, it is possible for us, following this overview of outturn, to decide on how the two million reported underspend is utilised. Of this, 200 and 55,000 pounds of new reserves are requested by service areas to be approved and these are detailed in paragraph 5.4 of the report and I hope that you've all had an opportunity um, to scrutinise this. The remaining 1.8 million is requested to be put into the following areas. 
400,000 towards the implementation costs of an upgrade to a new financial system, which is required to secure a sustainable platform for the, for the financial platform. And 1.4 million into the existing medium term financial plan reserve, which will help support the achievement of the corporate plan and future budgetary challenges. This will be key in the current climate we find ourselves in. So colleagues, I ask you to note and approve all of the reserve transfers within the section and all reserve movements, which are detailed in Appendix 5 of this report. The reserves balance at the 31st of March 2021, following on from the above approvals, is a balance of 87 million. This is a decrease from 103 million at the 31st of March 2020. In terms of the remaining balances, the general reserve remains the same at 6.5 million. It's also important to note that a significant amount of £42 million for the reserve balance is for the private finance initiative schemes that we have grants um, and that we have grants prepaid by Welsh Government and with these will be utilised over the remaining life of these schemes. So in summary, colleagues, it's proposed that Cabinet note the outturn position and the major variances for the financial year, approve the use of the underspend as described and note the resulting level of general and earmarked reserves. Approve the reserve transfers as set out in section five of this paper. Note schools outturn position on individual and collective school reserves and the um, concern expressed by the head of finance regarding this position. And note and comment and approve on the next steps as described. So just to take you back to um, the proposals that the Head of Finance has put forward for us to monitor this more closely. And the paper also ask, asks us to note the other areas of budget pressures and challenges and um, comment and approve on the action required to manage these. And again, in particular, for an enhanced senior leadership team focus on social care overspending. So that's the first of our financial um, papers today, colleagues. Um, the paper on the revenue outturn. And before I move that to the vote, would anybody like to come in with a comment? Councillor Cochrane. Yeah, th um, thank you, Leader. Um, one of the areas, obviously, of the overspend is the independent foster care agencies. And obviously, we've had a campaign of recruiting our own in-house, and it's, it's really paying dividends at the moment. They, they, there's been a, a, a huge um, increase in people wanting to be foster carers, and hopefully, if that if that's taken off, which is clearly I've, I've been told by Sally Jenkins, head of children's services, it's really it's, it's really going in the right direction. And hopefully, well, it, it will do um, it, it will decrease that independent foster care budget because we'll be doing it ourselves and it will be better for the children. I think that's one of the, the better things as well, having it local as well. The other thing is um, with the children out of area, Clearly, we, we're leading in Wales on that with our three care homes at the moment. Uh, Rosedale um, is the second house that we're doing at the moment. The scaffolding is up there, so they're working hard on that. And obviously, Windmill Farm um, is going to planning soon in the next uh, month, I think. And um, some good news in some respects is that we were, we were a bit concerned about ICF funding and we had a letter from in the RPB board last um, week that Andrew Goodall said that they have agreed political uh, across all political parties, ICF funding will be agreed for the whole year of next year. So, so that's really helped us clearly on, um, on Windmill Farm, which is going to be something of, of very unique throughout, uh, throughout Wales. Thank you, um, Councillor Cochrane. And um, 
I really like to thank all of the teams for the efforts that, that they've made around that, particularly the innovation that they've shown in, in social care. We really are at the forefront of developing new and innovative approaches that also deliver efficiencies for us as well. So, so thank you very much for those comments. Councillor Mayer. My hand was up by mistake. I was already, um, I, I hovered over it for the vote. Sorry, and I don't know how to take it down. Okay, okay, no problem. Councillor Giles. Thank you, Leader. Um, yes, I just uh, agree with Paul Cochrane first as well, Councillor Cochrane, because I think there's fantastic work going on there. And I've been fortunate enough to visit uh, Windmill Farm and um, it looks really, really impressive. So, um, you know, that, that's good work. And it was just really to reiterate the point you made about uh, the monitoring of the school budgets. Um, so, you know, the senior finance officers and chief, the chief education officer continue to regularly meet to monitor uh, the deficit uh, recovery plans. I mean, school budgets are monitored um, every year um, and, are, and are checked. Um, the schools continue to make significant savings, I understand, but it is certainly a challenge. I mean, clearly we don't know what the next year is going to bring um, and there are monthly forecasts. So um, I think schools will be receiving um, new guidance soon on setting budgets. And of course, we've got the independent reviews of school finances are underway uh, for secondary schools with significant deficits as well. There's a lot of work uh, clearly that's ongoing with that. And, um, and I just wanted to just touch, uh, Leader, if I may, on out of county for education. So really to uh, just to uh, reiterate again, um, it is an underspend. Uh, that's in part due to the school closures, which I'm sure everybody would understand. I mean, the finances have changed drastically in regard to schools. Um, the decrease in number of pupils being educated outside Newport, that is fantastic work that's been done over the last four years. Um, and to bring those children in to stay home near their families, near all their support, um, and then fantastic, um, you know, environments is really brilliant. And our investment in local provision. So you've got Ascol, Brindero, Mezebo and the new learning resource bases, um, as well as the independent providers like uh, Newport Live. So it's really just to reiterate the great work that's continued um, and obviously will continue despite the present circumstances. Thanks for that, Councillor Giles. Any other comments, colleagues? Are members um, content to agree and approve the report and the recommendations contained within? Yeah, everyone content with that? That's great. Thank you for that. Sorry, the pause is only while um, the electronic votes are, are coming in, just to be clear about that. OK. We'll move on then to the next item on our agenda, which is item five. That's the capital outturn and additions and members should have been able to find this on pages 49 to 70 of their packs. So item five on the agenda, capital outturn and additions. This report focuses on two parts of the capital programme. Firstly, the outturn position of the 2019-20 financial year and the impact on the capital programme of the slippage that's occurred. Secondly, the additions to the capital programme since the last capital report to Cabinet. During 1920, there was significant capital expenditure of £31 million across a number of important projects across Newport, including completion of the Band A and continuation of the Band B 21st Century School Programme, as well as a significant maintenance programme across a number of schools. 
support provided by generation initiatives in the city centre, including offices at the old sorting office in Mill Street and Charters Tower. The rollout of smaller bins, which has vastly improved our recycling rates and investment in energy saving schemes, including the street lighting LED project. A number of these projects will continue to be completed over the remainder of the programme, which currently runs to 2024-25. The 2019-20 outturn position highlights that despite there being a significant reprofiling of budgets during the financial year, there remains significant slippage at year end of 8.5 million. This effectively means that the programmed expenditure didn't happen fully and the budget is rolled forward or slipped into the next financial year. It's important to note that a large amount of slippage relates to schemes that span over a number of years. Therefore, it shouldn't be seen that a, a, this budget is not required it is simply the spend that will be incurred at a later date. This is allowable within regulations. So whilst this is allowable colleagues, um, slippage is unhelpful to us in modelling for treasury management and capital finance, financing budget purposes. So it's actually quite important that heads of service review their capital budgets on a regular basis and update the profiling of the, of, of the budget and the spend when they're aware of any changes. So this is quite important and it's an important message there for our heads of service. As well as the slippage, there's a small underspend relating to a small number of completed projects of just above £400,000. The main variances from the budget are outlined in the report and you can see that slippage has occurred across a number of service areas and isn't unique to one particular service area. As touched upon, the programme will need to be reviewed early in the financial year and individual project budgets reprofiled in line with more realistic and deliverable spending profiles. The next capital monitoring update to Cabinet will include an updated programme which will reflect this review. So I'm, I'm flagging up now colleagues that there, um, we will be seeing this in future. I'd like to highlight some changes to the approved programme and prior to this report, the council had already had an extensive capital programme to 2024-25. Um, the report highlights further additions to the programme of over 16 million pounds, taking the overall capital programme to 202 million pounds. So that's a significant investment there. All of the additions are shown in the table of the report and they are extensive, but just to highlight for you um, for the purposes of our meeting today, some of the main schemes. We've identified a further 3.3 million for Baselegg School, in addition to what was previously agreed for Band B, which will be funded from Section 106. 2.1 million pounds education maintenance grant from Welsh Government. £970,000 of targeted regeneration initiatives funding to help city centre redevelopment and a £1.75 million investment for the relocation of the information statement um, and this relates to a previous decision that the Cabinet has made. For the majority of the additions, the Council has been successful in securing external funding for projects through Welsh Government grants or Section 106 funds. And this is vital in ensuring that the capital programme remains affordable. And this funding builds on the already extensive capital commitments that the Council has made. Further detail of changes to the programme, including slippage and additions are, are shown in Appendix A and colleagues will be asked to approve these changes. As touched upon, and we have discussed this a number of times, our medium term financial plan has revenue budgets included, which allows a level of headroom for further capital expenditure to be funded through borrowing. A 
Further, 2.4 million is required to be utilised from the headroom, but also during 19, uh, sorry, 2019-20, the council was able to substitute previously committed borrowing with grants, which has allowed the headroom to be at 20.7 million. Whilst this does appear to be a significant amount, it's really important for us to note that the council has a number of demands on capital, and this level of headroom would really be um, very easily utilised. Therefore, we're asking senior officers to undertake a review of the current programme, the future capital demands and the impact of the revenue budget and report back to Cabinet with its recommendations on the future capital programme. So this is something that we will be receiving further information on from officers when they've reviewed this. The report that we have before us also provides an update on capital receipts, which form part of this headroom. Currently, within that headroom, there are £4.4 million of uncommitted capital receipts. So, um, colleagues, I've given you an overview of the report that we have there in our packs, and I've also been able to highlight some additional um, capital investment, particularly in our schools, which I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to do. So today, colleagues, I'm asking you to uh, approve the changes to the capital programme, including the slippage and additions, and note the reprofiling that this gives rise to. The paper asks us to note the remaining available capital resources, note the outturn position, and note the balance and approve the allocation of capital receipts. Before I move the report, colleagues, would anyone like to comment? Councillor Davis. Thank you, Leader. It's just two quick comments, really. First of all, I'm um, I'm grateful. It's only a small amount, but it's within the cap capital programme, Section 106 money. It's only £3,000, but it's to the local Brecon Park, which is whilst it's in St Julian's Ward, actually Brecon um, Beach, um, Beachwood residents use it and it's very much welcomed. Small amount of money, but it's going to make a huge difference to children's lives in that area. So thank you for that. And the other point I'd like to make is in relation to the variance in the budget in relation to the vehicle replacement programme. Yes, there is a variance, but I welcome that greater consideration is going to be given to the purchase of electric vehicles in, uh, for use within our fleet and discussions are being undertaken in regard to that because we have to achieve the objective of zero carbon emissions as, as a um, local authority by 2030 and it's the ambition of Welsh Government that we achieve zero emissions by 2050. So I welcome the work that's going, being put towards achieving that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Any further comments? Councillor Jevons. Yeah, thank you, Nita. Could I just echo Councillor Davis's comments regarding uh, ULEV vehicles? Very important to us as we move forward. Um, and we're looking at research into also electric uh, refuse trucks at the minute. Um, so we, the work is ongoing is, is, is taking shape. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And it's very positive to, to hear these reports of the actions that we are taking as an authority in terms of um, reducing our carbon footprint. And I do appreciate the work that all of your service areas are doing on this because it remains a priority for us moving forward. So colleagues, um, we've had an opportunity to review the paper and we've discussed some of the um, key issues in it here today. Are colleagues happy um, to agree the paper and um, approve the changes that we've discussed? OK, thank you all and thank you all for um, voting on that item. Remaining with finance and um, rightly so uh, at this very important time, item six on our agenda is our Treasury Management outing for 2019-20 and colleagues can see this on pages 71 to 84 of their report packs. And the report details the Treasury management activities of the Council for 2019-20.
So um, just to be clear, it's a backwards looking report and it confirms that all borrowing and investments undertaken during the financial year were expected and were in line with the agreed uh, limits which were set by full council. So you recall we take the Treasury Management Strategy to full council for a, approval and agreement and um, this report highlights that we've stayed within that approval. It also confirms that 2019-20 prudential indicators for Treasury management were also met in line with those set by the Council. So um, thank you to colleagues in finance for their prudent financial management there and um, their um, Treasury management activities. So the Council's current strategy is to fund capital expenditure through reducing investments rather than undertake new borrowing where it can. We defer taking out new long-term borrowing and fund capital expenditure from our own cash resources, mainly reserves. By using this strategy, the Council can also minimise cash holding at a time when um, counterparty risk remains relatively high, especially within the current economic implications during COVID-19. The level of internal borrowing is around 87 million and by using this strategy it is estimated that the council saves around 2.6 million pounds in revenue cost based on current interest rates. So just to emphasize that colleagues, um, the strategy that we have is saving us 2.6 million pounds. So, so uh, again, thank you to officers for their prudent financial management there. The level of external borrowing that the Council held at the 31st of March 2020 was still significant at 166 million. And this will only increase in future years as our ability to be internally borrowed reduces as our reserves are utilised. Of this 166 million, it is important to note that an additional 15 million of borrowing was undertaken to enable the council to be a front runner in supporting the response of COVID-19 and administering business grants to businesses in Newport prior to the funding being received by Welsh Government. I'd like to pause there, colleagues, and, and emphasise the importance of that and that undertaking um, in terms of keeping many of our businesses afloat here, here in Newport. For many of those businesses, it did make the difference um, between whether they, they were forced to close down or their survival. So I'd really like to um, commend the, the finance team again for their, their prudent management and um, smart thinking on that. And, and just to share with you colleagues and to share, to share with the wiser public as well, we've had a significant number of, of complementary responses from businesses, from um, individuals and businesses, really highlighting what a difference that has made. So, so again, I'd like to thank the team for that. And I'd particularly like to highlight at this stage the, the um, effort that both Emma and Dom has put into this in terms of the work that they have done. Um, they are um, officers that have led their teams, that have worked with their teams and gone over and above what is required of them to support businesses across the city. So, and I'd like to thank them publicly for that. Moving on, the investment balance at the 31st of March 2020 was 12.5 million, taking net borrowing to 1.5 153.8 million. This is an in increase of 17.2 million on the previous year. It should be noted that the Council will keep a minimum investment balance to satisfy the requirements of being deemed a professional body for compliance purposes. The, rep the report before us also details non-Treasury investments as required by Welsh Government and this includes investments in directly owned property such as commercial and industrial units, loans to local businesses and landlords and shareholdings in subsidiaries, which in our case would be Newport Transport. The total value of these investments as of the 31st of March was 14.5 million. 
The Treasury Management Report um, is a report that we take to full council. So at this stage, because full council are required to approve the report, we um, cabinet are asked to note and make any comments on the report and then agree that the report can be taken to full council for approval. So colleagues, if you're content with this report today, it can um, go to our September council meeting. Would anybody like to comment on this report before um, we um, confirm that we note it? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Leader. I just want to echo your thanks because all of us right across the board were contacted by businesses who were hit really hard with COVID. Add to that the tragic loss of life that's been suffered right across the board from all of us, from all, all of us know somebody and we've all lost somebody. It's been a horrendous time. It's been unprecedented. We've all said it time and time again. But I really, really want to echo my thanks to our departments that have, yes, they've done their job, but they've gone over and above what was expected of them. And without their knowledge, their quick working, I don't think we'd have managed as well as we have, to be perfectly honest with you. So I just want to say thank you to all the teams. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Rahman. Thank you, Leader. I just want to um, follow on from Councillor Harvey there because, um, as you are well aware, we suffered really badly in Mainly with regards to COVID, and a lot of our businesses in Mainly are small family run businesses, and they were greatly affected by the lockdown. The quick action that this authority took to get the grant money out there as fast as possible paid dividends and helped a lot of families um, in, in, in Mainly. A lot of people don't realise that although there might be one person who owns the shop, there's a family behind it. There's daughters, there's sons, there's mothers, um, there's in-laws. There's a whole family unit behind it and a lot of them suffered as a result of COVID and having that financial help ease that pain a bit for them as well. So my thanks as well to the finance team. My thanks to you, Leader, as well, for taking really quick action, um, you know, to make sure that money go out in the community where it was required. We're slowly seeing the businesses reopen in Mainly, and we saw one new business open up in Mainly as well. So slowly we're recovering. There's good news ahead, hopefully, but that quick action that we took, and I must add, I must add as well, because I have family members who have got businesses in other authorities, I'm not naming names, but those authorities were way behind us. And I had questions from those family members who have businesses in other council areas. How come Newport was acting so quick and that the other councils, some large councils, weren't acting quick enough? So I think we were ahead of the curve and we did a brilliant job. Thank you to the finance team and uh, thank you, Lead, as well, for approving the work, especially during lockdown while you were shielding, because you were right on, uh, right on it and you were working all the way through and it paid dividends and it showed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rahman. Thank you very much. Would any other colleagues like to um, comment on that report? Okay then, so are colleagues content to um, note that report and agree that it's re, um, referred onwards to full council for discussion and approval. Yeah, everyone can attempt that. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Colleagues, we move on to the um, next item on the agenda, which is item seven. And um, this item is our May revenue budget monitor. You can find this on pages 85 um, to 106. Now, whilst our first paper today um, was really uh, the 
marked the closure of the end of the last financial year and I said very clearly at the start of our first paper that there was there was very minimal impact of COVID um, in that report. This report, I suppose, is, is the complete opposite of that. So the May Revenue Budget Monitor is the first forecast of the year and it does highlight for us the key financial issues arise, arising from the COVID-19 pandemic and also highlights the ongoing impact that this may have on the 2020-21 revenue budget. So this, um, I, this, this is a very, very serious um, position and it really does highlight um, the impact that COVID is having and continues to have on local authority finances. So I will go through this in quite a bit of detail because there are a number of areas that I think is really important to highlight and to ensure um, through this meeting that um, the public are aware of as well. So firstly, when we're looking at this and we're considering this, it is actually really important to note that during these unprecedented times, there are a number of uncertainties around the lifting of the lockdown, the measures that need to be put in place and the impact on local authorities. And this is, I suppose, a fluid situation. We're in a positive situation at the moment, but this will, as we know, continue to change. So within this uh, report, then a number of assumptions have been required to be made within the projections, including assumptions on further Welsh Government funding and further expenditure and income recovery. In the first quarter of the pandemic, the Council has taken significant steps to respond with services transitioning into an essential services model, delivering core services to the most vulnerable and the most affected by the threat of the virus. During this first quarter, the Council has faced significant costs in delivering these services. But up until the end of June, this expenditure was largely covered by the financial support provided by Welsh Government through the Hardship Fund, which covered specific groups in homelessness, free school meal provision, social care providers, and also a general fund to support local government to support the response to COVID-19. The Council has just finalised its claim for June with the value claimed by Newport for the quarter of over £7 million. So um, that is a considerable sum of money and it just gives a, just, just a partial understanding of the impact that this um, pandemic has had on government finances. And I'd like to highlight um, that this doesn't just impact on local authority finances, it also impacts on Welsh government finances as well. So, so we need to be mindful of the impact on funding across the whole of the, pu of the public sector here in Wales. There are, however, a number of ongoing financial pressures that will continue during this pandemic including additional costs to support our vulnerable residents and maintain core services. And also, and we must be mindful of this colleagues, in relation to loss of income as a result of the pandemic. In addition, there are other challenges facing council budgets, which includes overspends on demand led services, delivery of savings. So some of those proposed savings have already been impacted upon either directly or indirectly as a result of the pandemic and also the impact of ongoing school budget overspending. The May position is forecasting an overspend for the financial year of 5.4 million, assuming that the revenue contingency budget is fully committed. This would reduce the four, re, this would reduce to 4 million if the contingency remains available at year end. This is a significant overspend against budget and reflects the challenge that the Council continues to face in its response to the pandemic. The main overspending areas that contribute to the position include the following. So um, unavoidable costs that continue beyond the first quarter that currently are not assumed to be funded by Welsh Government. This um, 
relates to a sum of around £1.7 million. £3.7 million in relation to the loss of income as a result of the pandemic. Around £400,000 of demand-led service area overspending in social care. And £1.1 million of undelivered savings for 2020-21 and around 840,000 due to the impact of schools overspending. As we've touched on earlier, the current situation does have a layer of complexity and therefore there is some degree of uncertainty in relation to the forecasts and these need to be worked through. So the forecast will be updated throughout the year as more certainty is provided around the recovery re requirements and associated funding. And, and as you'll be fully aware, colleagues, um, the Welsh Government's ability to um, invest and um, in provide additional funding for local authorities is very much dependent upon the consequential um, funding that they receive from the UK Government. So, um, we must be mindful of that and consider this report within that um, overall financial context. So we envisage that um, there, there are um, some positives and some negatives in terms of the current forecasts. In terms of positives, um, there's currently Um, no Welsh Government funding included for the loss of income in quarter one. So um, whilst Welsh Government have uh, announced a value set aside for this purpose for all of Wales, there's not, at the time of writing, there wasn't a confirmation of how this would be um, distributed and the final amount made available to Newport. And so therefore, we do know that um, the po there is a positive in terms of we will receive some additional funding from Welsh Government, just um, no certainty on that sum at this time. And that's why important is so important that we keep monitoring this very closely. Secondly, there may be further Welsh Government support made available for costs and income losses in quarter two and beyond. And I'd just like to highlight um, for you colleagues that this work is ongoing. So WLGA representatives are working closely with Welsh Government on this and certainly their finance group meets regularly with Welsh Government and they are continuing to work through um, so the costs incurred by local authority and the income losses that they will be submitting to Welsh Government um, for the second quarter. However, um, there may be further downside risks from the forecast and, and we need to be mindful of this colleagues because this could work worsen our position. And these include the level of council tax reduction scheme costs increasing as the economic downturn bites. So um, we are very mindful that a higher volume of people will become eligible for council tax, uh, the council tax reduction scheme. Also, our services will need to continue to work through the forecast in detail on the impact of responses um, to the pandemic. There are a few aspects of this that I'd just like to highlight briefly um, in relation to this uh, report. So there are obvious um, ongoing costs and additional costs in relation to social care. And there are two other areas where forecasts have been included um, for significant costs to continue beyond quarter one. And these are around waste and cleansing and housing and homelessness. And those unavoidable costs, which will continue, actually contribute close to £1.6 million of the unavoidable costs. So we're talking about significant sums of money here. And this, these are all um, unavoidable costs incurred due to our response to the, the pandemic. Loss of income is uh, potentially very substantial for us and this is again something that we need to keep a watchful eye on. So uh, this is currently estimated at 3.7 million uh, for the year with a loss at quarter one totaling £2 million. 
So this, this um, if you think about the reports that we've already have had today, where we talk about our treasury management, we talk about capital and we talk about borrowing, our ability to borrow is clearly determined by our ability to, to repay that borrowing. And we need to look there very closely at our revenue income streams, which facilitate that. So there is a relationship between all of the papers that we've looked at today. We need to be mindful of this. In terms of those losses, if I can just give you um, a sense of um, where we've lost income. These are for things like our um, non-residential services, so our day centres. Um, we've lost around a million pounds on our waste services and a significant loss of income on parking services. So we've lost around £700,000 on um, parking services. And of course, with the very limited public service uh, public transport for provision during this period, we've lost um, around £320,000 on uh, bus station departure fees as well. So Welsh Government have announced that £78 million is available to account for lost income across Wales, but um, we, we are waiting um, confirmation of the allocation, as I mentioned previously. In addition to this, um, we, we need to be mindful of the demand led budgets overspending. So we've um, highlighted the key areas, the key statutory areas where the bud our budgets um, do overspend. And we need to be very watchful of these budgets in future. And I would add to that um, the, the non delivery of savings. Now on the non delivery of savings, um, some, some of those aspects are beyond the control of heads of service, but when it comes to other aspects of the proposed savings, they are well within the control of heads of service. And we do expect heads of service to keep a very, very tight um, grip on budgets this year and monitor very closely um, their both income and expenditure against those. It's never been a more critical time um, for prudent financial management at every level throughout the local authority. I've highlighted um, the issues uh, around the school's position and we've discussed this at length in many cabinet um, meetings, but what I would um, highlight colleagues is that in our budget we did approve additional funding for analytical and senior leader leadership capacity to support schools in um, addressing some of the financial issues that they have. So officers are working very closely on this and they're closely engaged with this and we'll be considering a detailed briefing on the findings of this very soon. So in the context of all of the above, we, we need to touch on our reserves overall. Our projections assume that in line with planned and expected use, the council will utilise around 60%, 16 sorry, percent of the reserves in the financial year. However, this doesn't include covering the forecast overspend detailed in the report. We do have a good level of reserves and um, we need to be mindful that actually um, whilst on the balance sheet, the reserves do appear to be good. Much of this finance is already um, earmarked for specific use. So we do need to be mindful of that. Whilst it does appear on paper to be um, a high level of reserves, much of that finance is already committed. So we need to be very clear about that. What this report does um, it really sets out some of the significant financial pressures that we're starting to experience from the pandemic. There are there are uncertainties around this and uh, just to give you the assurance colleagues that we are in regular dialogue with Welsh Government um, on this particular issue and the, the 22 local authority leaders meet weekly um, with the Minister for Local Government and Housing and other ministers from Welsh Government to um, closely monitor this position and um, 
we work very closely with the WLGA to highlight the financial challenges that local authorities face during this period. So before I move um, the paper, I'd just like to invite colleagues to come in and comment. Councillor Rahman. Thank you, Leader. Um, I just want to mention about obviously um, the uncertainty uh, around uh, the budget and what's going to happen. I mean, we're told by the Prime Minister that this is the end of austerity. I, I mean, the Chancellor has said it's the end of austerity. The Conservative Party is saying the end of austerity, but I don't see that happening, to be honest with you. When the government itself has borrowed and spent so much money, um, you know, the natural reaction would be to tighten their belt even further or raise taxes, which causes another issue for our residents, and that is how much can they afford? Um, I, I want to get the message out there that what you've said, Leader, is that we are a compassionate uh, authority and there will be help available for those that struggle with council tax. Um, but very much so, it needs to uh, be highlighted that this authority faces a loss of income of £3.7 million, pound, and that's not a small amount of money when we're, we've already cut over £45 million in the last five, six years alone. So further 3.7 million lots is going to be devastating for all of us. Um, the Welsh Government's priority, quite rightly so, should be on the NHS to prevent a second wave of uh, the pandemic. Um, and it should be on uh, recovering our economy and um, on education as well. Um, but I fear for this authority, um, we do have good plans going ahead, but that uncertainty is still going to loom over us, I'm afraid. But the people in, in Newport need to know that we are compassionate. We understand the struggles they're going to go through because we're going through the same struggles as well as individuals. And that we as councillors, we as the cabinet, we as this council will be there to help them. Thank you. Absolutely, Councillor Rahman. I fully support everything that you've said there. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Leader. And it's following on from um, Councillor Rahman's comments. As a um, Cabinet member with responsibility to, of overseeing the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, I've um, met with officers and discussed and have full insight in relation to the impact that COVID has had so far on that budget. We are still in budget. We, we are concerned as we believe that the vast proportion of those people who will probably will be eligible for those funds as a, re, as, as, a, uh, as a result of COVID probably haven't applied yet because many people may well consider themselves to be furloughed and they're probably still waking up to the fact that actually they may well, their businesses have gone bust or they may well have been made redundant. So we're aware there'll be, there will be um, future pressures on that budget. But there is entitlement to that fund and what we actually have to do is to make sure we support our residents and promote the fact that they can actually access that fund and that reduction scheme is there for them to 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 make the best use of to ensure there's extra income coming into their households and so it, it is vital that yes we may get tight but we need to consider where our reserves will go to support our residents if it comes to that thank you thank you leader absolutely thank you councillor davis councillor truman uh, thank you, Leader. I just like to make a comment on um, uh, it's outlined in the report greatly the challenges that, that are facing the council, and this is going to be with us unfortunately for a number of years. The challenges of this. Hopefully, we'll get a, a vaccine and we move out of um, the COVID pandemic as soon as we can. But the costs in, in being incurred by councils and government is going to continue on for a number of years, and. We, do, we always deliver the services, we're on, we're on, we're on the ground. Our, our staff, as we heard earlier on, and they certainly were, they were all out there doing their bit, you know, putting themselves at risk in some cases. They were doing that, you know, and above and above, beyond the call, they were doing all that. But it's the challenges, that's the thing. We've got a global pandemic now. No councils have seen before, I'm sure they haven't, that the, the situation we're in at the moment. But, we, to keep functioning, we've got to have adequate funding of central government and the Welsh Assembly, or the Senate, as I should say now. But we do need that because, as I say, 
we're out there, as our, our staff are out there daily facing all the challenges and um, they all deserve a medal, all of them, every one of them, but everything has got to be paid for. And that is right, right. But as you say, we don't know at the moment, we, you know, we've got to keep trying to get the right resources for us because we're delivering it daily. And, and as I say, it's going to be these challenges, financial challenges, are going to be with us for, for many years. And we've got out of the funding because we've got to deliver the deliver the services. As I've said many times before, local councils, whatever the colour of them, they deliver the services. They're on the ground, and that's and that's how it's always worked. We get the money from Central and the Senate now, but we get out of the money to deal with this because, God forbid, there be a, a, another spike of this. And we know what's going to have to happen then. We've got to go into what we've got to do everything else and the costs are escalating. We've got to meet the challenges, these financial challenges, if we are to carry on what we're doing. Absolutely, Councillor Truman. Absolutely. Deputy Leader. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Leader. Um, we, we've all heard in the news about the serious concerns over budgetary issues that other councils have, all councils across Wales and England. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on, on the significant amounts of, of, regarding waste that are mentioned um, generated by the holds on, on, on commercial activity at the landfill site, trade waste, special collections. But <clears throat> my real crux really is to put on, 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 on record my thanks to the refuse teams, both of NCC and, and of Waste Savers, who have taken a risk probably over and above lots and lots of people, and that's with no disrespect to others. Um, so many thanks to those. Um, Car parks, as mentioned in the report, are open again, um, but they are slow to respond, um, and I can understand the reasoning for that. But this is all at a cost to, to Newport City Council. Uh, the Household Waste Recycling Centre is, is back open down at Mays Glass with a booking system which is working very well, uh, alleviating queues on, on the Southern Distributor Road, and we've had many, many positive comments around that. Um, <clears throat> but we are in serious times. And these are the sort of amounts of money that can rack up very, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Leader. Um, I just want to echo what everyone has said. Um, waste savers and our refuse collection have been first class. I cannot fault them. They have been out every week, no matter what. They're there, they're picking it up, they're bringing the boxes back, they're explaining, please don't touch that, you need to wash your hands. They have just really, really worked medicals. And um, this pandemic, as we all know, it's not something I expected to live through. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Yes, it's cost millions of pounds and it's, it's no insignificant amount. It is millions and millions of pounds. However, our residents and the people of this city as far as I'm concerned, they come above and beyond everything else. We have got the best staff ever known in any council, and I will defy anyone to tell me any different. All of them, no matter what little amount they think they've done, they have all stepped up, they've gone out at their own personal risk, and they've still completed and acted in the most professional way I have ever known. And thank you to our staff, it seems such a little thing to say when they have done so much behind the scenes, not looking for a pat on the back. They've just got on with their job and they've supported us. As have yourself and the deputy leader going forward, you have been constantly online working through this pandemic. And like I said, none of us ever expected it. None of us ever thought we'd have to live through one, but we have. As for the finances, yes, they're strict. And no, we haven't got a, a money tree in the garden. I wish I did. We could go and collect some money and sort it out. But I am I am really concerned that the government are apparently now going to start their sanctions on the benefits. They're bringing them back in. And I'm worried because we cannot get our systems up and running, COVID protected until August the 10th. And if people need to get online before August the 10th because they're going to bring their sanctions back for their benefits, I am really concerned. And I don't think central government have thought this through properly. That's all. 
Thank you, Councillor Harvey. And you highlight a very, very important point there in relation um, to the DWP and the English government. Um, Myrian, would you like to come in and provide us with an update on our current financial uh, position? We did mention that um, there's a lot of movement here, so um, hopefully you have some news for us. You're on mute, Myrian. Thanks, Lida. Um, Yes, this this uh, report was was obviously written two or three weeks week, weeks ago. So uh, so there has been some some sort of changes. Um, so in terms of Welsh government support, um, uh, they've it's good to know that they've allocated the full seventy eight million for that income income loss. Um, a big chunk of that has now been agreed in terms of how it's been distributed. So so Newport Council should be getting around eight hundred thousand from that first um tranche that's good good news our total claim was two million in that in that in, in that first uh, first quarter so eight hundred thousand uh is is uh, is sorted and sort of confirmed um the balance um is still yet to be decided but i think that we can confidently predict that there'll be plus another sum of money as well uh on 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 that as well so so that's positive news and uh it takes us you know in the in the right in the right way and just to confirm that some further wise government support is now confirmed for the ongoing cost of social care um in terms of the increased cost of our providers now that's already been assumed in our forecast so it, it doesn't change in our forecast but but it's useful just to confirm that 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 that, that, that funding is 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 there now so that's the update um we will need to wait until probably the end of the second quarter so se september just to get an idea as to where council tax and council tax reduction scheme are kind of going we do need a bit of a, a bit of time um to see how, 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 how that goes um so we can we can expect these forecasts to be to be you know changing and to be quite quite fluid but what I can confirm to you today is that is that certainly the things that we that, that we know have moved it in the in the right direction. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Myrian. And and uh, I'd like to thank you personally on behalf of all of the cabinet colleagues for um, the leadership that you've shown on this issue during this period. So thank you very much for that um, and your efforts around that. We do value that and appreciate it very much. So colleagues, are you content uh, to move this uh, report? Yeah. Great. Thank you very much for that and uh, thank you for your responses. So the first part of our meeting today is focused very much on our um, financial situation and the position that we find ourselves in. I'd like to move now to um, item eight on our agenda today, which is our school's recovery programme. And you, colleagues, you'll find this paper on pages 107 to 120 of um, the packs that you have today. Just um, as a, by way of an introduction, I'd like to highlight that um, critical worker and vulnerable children childcare has been in place in, within our schools since they closed um, in March. And since the 29th of June, these schemes have continued to run alongside the partial opening of school for other, other learners. Collaborative planning between officers and head teachers has been highly effective um, in order to enable them to develop a shared understanding of issues and to address concerns as quickly as possible. Students haven't sat exams this year and therefore um, summer grades will be based on coursework and teacher predicted grades. Schools have been challenged um, 
by families for their adherence to the Welsh Government advice of not mixing bubbles of children um, between and within settings. But it's important to note, as with every activity that's been undertaken during this time in relation to this, that this has been put into operation in line with expert advice in order to protect our children, to pr protect our staff and the wider community. Around 5,400 children and young people across Newport have continued to be supported by the free school meal scheme. And following the closure of our schools in March, the support developed um, from providing a lunch for collection to a voucher scheme sent directly to families. I'm very pleased also to note the work that the EAS has done in working with schools to support the development of an effective blended learning programme, which supports our learners in, in childcare provision, checking classes, and those who've not yet returned to school. So I've just given you really um, an overview there of the position that we found ourselves in and in a relatively short space of time there's actually been quite a lot of activity. I'd like to take this opportunity to um, pause for a moment just to um, give thanks to the head teachers and other other professionals within the education environment for the efforts that they have made to maintain this childcare provision during this period their contribution has been absolutely outstanding and again yet another example of professionals going above and beyond in terms of their commitment and dedication to public service and in this particular case their public service has enabled key workers to continue to work and respond to this crisis and we should never forget the contribution that our, our, our schools and our head teachers have made in this and I personally thank all of our head teachers across Newport for the way that they have engaged with this. There, there, there really are no words to effectively articulate this because their, their contribution has been absolutely outstanding. And I know, Cabinet Member, that you've been very proud of the achievements um, of our schools during this period. So I'd just like to invite you to speak on this report. Thank you very much, Leader. Thank you. I certainly am, yeah. Um, so within days of closing in March, a significant number of childcare hubs for children of critical workers and vulnerable learners were in operation alongside the provision of distance learning, as you mentioned. In addition to this, schools are supporting pupils transition into secondary school and to post 16 opportunities, you know, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult time for those youngsters. They're used to transitioning now and having that, um, you know, that opportunity to go to the big school. And, and uh, so not only are they not in school, but they're not having those opportunities to for their future education and what's going to happen. 36 childcare hubs operated across the city, enabling children to access childcare in their community. I believe that's the largest number in any local authority, certainly within our region. So that's a tremendous achievement. So since schools reopened on the 29th of June, around 400 children have continued to attend childcare each day, enabling critical workers to attend employment. It's been challenging for schools to provide this service whilst also offering other children the ability to attend school, to check in and check up with school staff, as well as complying with their risk assessments, which promote the safety of all on site. And of course, that is ultimately the main aim at the moment and the ongoing uh, for the future, foreseeable future, is safety and well-being. There remain a number of key areas to address. Provision of school transport, particularly adhering to social distancing requirements, poses a significant challenge, particularly for those learners attending, <coughs> excuse me, Welsh medium, special and Catholic schools. While some transport is in place, further is required for the autumn term. Almost 800, 800 digital and around 1,260 MiFi units devices have been issued to families to support distance learning. 
Additionally, a school Wi-Fi network that allows children and young people to bring their own devices to school has been established. Building on the success remains a priority. Pupil attendance at schools has not been compulsory, as we know, since schools reopened on the 29th of June, and attendance in individual schools has varied. Weekly attendance data is being provided to the Welsh Government, with the most recent full week attendances last week being nurseries were 47%, primary schools overall attendance was 67%, secondary schools achieved an overall attendance of 44%, and the special school pupil referral unit across the three settings achieved an overall attendance of 47%. But as we mentioned, there are variations between each individual school. They are, it's very, very complex. Um, and uh, it's a really fantastic achievement that they've all, they've all met. On the 9th of July, uh, Welsh Government announced that schools will return to full capacity by mid-September with only limited social distancing within contact groups. At full operations, a contact group should consist of around 30 children. Some direct or indirect mixing between children in different contact groups will also be unavoidable, such as on transport, receiving specialist teaching or due to staffing constraints. Social distancing for adults should remain in line with regulations and guidance every school should continue to be COVID protected, having carried out risk assessments and mitigated them with a combination of controls such as hand and surface hygiene, one-way systems and so forth. If early warning information shows a local incident or outbreak, then nearby schools should implement appropriate restriction measures. And to support effective track and trace, each school will be provided with a supply of home testing kits. A priority now is that we continue to work with our communities to build their confidence and ensure learners return to a supportive learning environment. And I certainly reiterate your comments, Leader, with regard to thanks for the work that's being done. I, I thank everyone too, the Chief Education Officer officers, and certainly our schools and education settings for their outstanding work and commitment over the last year, and especially, of course, over the last few months. And we are also absolutely committed to our young people and will continue to ensure that everything that can be done will be done to support them through the next period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Giles. Councillor Ryan, would you like to comment? Thank you, uh, Leader. Just a couple of uh, points I wanted to pick up on um, that. Uh, Councillor Giles has mentioned and it's really important that it's, it is highlighted. First of all, I, I obviously want to comment that I did have concerns uh, about the schools reopening, especially as the governor for Maidy Primary School and the large amount of BAME people affected by uh, COVID-19. Um, but it is essential that we reopen schools, that there's some return to normality. I think um, the way the teachers and the authority have acted in ensuring the safety of not just people and teachers, but also families and parents has been outstanding. So I'd, I'd like to pass on my thanks as well to the teachers and to the staff in the education services and Councillor Giles uh, for keeping an eye out throughout the lockdown period. I, I just want to mention as well uh, on um, page 113, 113 of the agenda pack, you, it mentions there about supporting uh, digitally excluded learners. I mean, it's been tremendous the work that has been done in covering those people um, that have are digitally excluded. I mean, first of all, identifying uh, those peoples that didn't have uh, devices or access to the internet, but then also quickly and um, efficiently getting out those devices and MiFi units, as Councillor Giles has mentioned. I mean, the figures are staggering. 2,565 pupils digitally excluded, but then on top of that there then what the authority has managed to do is get 850 digital devices out there, but then get 773 devices refitted and loaned out. And refitting a device is no mean measure. I mean, but 773 in a short period of time, that's absolutely amazing. And also getting access out there to one, uh, getting 1,261 
Wi-Fi units out there, absolutely brilliant as well. But it shows and it should be highlighted to government, not just Welsh government, but also UK government, that there is an issue with pupils and um, with families not having access to the internet and being digitally excluded. Poverty is an issue and there is no easy answer for this other than investing in those families. I also want to mention as well the fact that schools are reopening also helps the mental health of pupils as well as we should really mention that as I mentioned in Mainly there's been a lot of deaths and those children that would normally go to school they would get support it's not all about education it's not about learning but it's the pastoral care that they receive the compassion that they receive from the teachers they can finally get that now so they can um, you know deal with their bereavement in a in a sensible way so it's really important to mention the impact on mental health um, but well done to the education service well done to council jobs who worked really hard and kept an eye out throughout the lockdown period i mean no one's been um, sitting in the armchair watching tv during this period everyone's been working hard and it really shows now and when come september i mean the teachers are already planning some amazing things to protect them and it's going to be brilliant i think we're in a good position so thank you all thank you councillor rama thank you very much for that councillor truman thank you leader leader these these child care hubs prove to me Newport at its best. As I say, when Newport comes together, and it certainly has come together with this COVID-19 um, pandemic we've had, it's really come together and it, it's done that. Newport has done that. But as, as you say, these these hubs in the schools are fantastic. You know, I, I see them coming past my house, you know, for that time, the school at the top and all the other schools in Newport. Outstanding piece of work. They didn't have to do it. They weren't compelled to do it, but they wanted to do it. They volunteered in, to do it. Uh, providing this child care at a time when critical care workers were needed most of all in their with their job and and it enabled them to do that and it's a fan you know we can never thank thank these people enough for doing this we said it earlier on i will carry on saying it through the agenda I, i'm sure it is really newport at its best we had a lot of negativity over the years don't we but newport does come together and it's come certainly come together we've seen examples daily hourly of outstanding achievements of people all to help their neighbours, uh, doing some shopping, all sorts of things. Newport at his best, absolutely fantastic. I couldn't agree more, Councillor Truman, so thank you very much for that. Um, Deputy Leader. Yes, thank you, Leader. We seem to be on a, a mission of thanks today and, and it's very, very much needed, uh, let, let's be honest. Um, I'm chair of governors at St Andrews and I actually took the time to go and to look at their preparations for for <coughs> reopening um, <coughs> reopening in July. Um, I, ho I also had concerns about schools reopening for those three weeks, but I understand fully understand the reasons why. But I'd like again to put on record all thanks, big thanks to staff, pupils, but also parents and carers for understanding why we did what we had to do um, in this phased return. Um, now and in the times to come. They will be difficult times. So many thanks to all, but certainly to parents and carers for understanding and working with us to return children to school. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and and I, I, I think this, what this, uh, considering this report on the recovery programme has done, it really has given us an opportunity to express our thanks for everybody in, involved in um, in the response to the pandemic and the recovery going forward. Now, I know um, that Andrew is here on our meeting as well. So just before I move this report, Andrew, is there anything that you would like to add to this from the officer perspective? Uh, good afternoon, Leader. Um, thank you for the comments and just I'm really humbled by how schools, the head teachers, teachers and teaching assistants have worked collaboratively with us as officers and with their chair of governors to really care for the community. It's, it's been a fantastic collaborative effort 
we're ready to go for September. Schools and schools are very keen to have their children back. They're looking forward to supporting the community and I'm so proud of everything that we've done together. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you very much for the ongoing work that both your colleagues and yourself are doing on this. Thank you. You make us very proud. Thank you. So we've we've had an opportunity um, to discuss uh, that report. Are members content with that report? Can I ask you now to um, express your content for that? With that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for that. I move now to um, item nine on our agenda today, which is an update on uh, the Western Gateway. Colleagues, you may have um, heard of this. You can find the paper that we have on pages 121 to 128 of the packs that we've got. Um, you may well have seen the Western Gateway featured in the news. I think there's an opportunity here, really. Um, the paper provides us with an update on the activities of the Western Gateway. And you will recall, colleagues, that in 2016, Bristol, Newport and Cardiff City Councils um, did a piece of work, we commissioned a piece of work, on what we describe as the Great Western Cities report. And what that report was looking at was the um, really the economic geography of the region and the opportunities for us um, within that as a group of cities. Connectivity there for us, um, of course, was um, in relation to um, our, our, the M4 corridor and our relationship with this. That economic partnership, as, as you'll be aware, has continued to grow and continue to develop. And in November 2019, the Western Gateway was actually launched. Um, the Western Gateway has evolved from the Great Western Cities Initiative and is a strategic partnership which aims to deliver an economic powerhouse along the M4 and M5 corridor. And the purpose of this is to drive growth on both sides of the River Seine. As one of the five cities involved in this partnership, Newport is expected to be a key player in the success of the partnership and stands to profit from the benefits the greater collaboration um, brings. So the region is already considered a major economic powerhouse and it contains uh, three city regions, each of which have identified um, five key areas of opportunity um, for growth and development. If we look across the region as a whole, we've actually got a higher GVA per head than the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands Engine. And a pre-lockdown economy in the region of £107 million. And that's nearly double that which existed within the former Great Western Cities so you can see as this partnership has grown, the, um, the economy has also grown um, to include those wider areas within the region. Looking across the partnership, we've got nearly 4.4 um, million residents, around about 160,000 businesses and in the, in the region of 2.1 million jobs. What I'd like to highlight um, a particular benefit of this partnership in this region in terms of the excellent connectivity that we have with our major motorways and roads to airports. And I think what will be increasingly important in future, nine ports. So you can see the potential for economic activity here across the region. Just to bring you up to date on um, the work that's gone on so far, the, part, the partners have come together and we've uh, published a prospectus and that has been included in the report for members' attention. So the, the prospectus confirms that the Western Gateway is propelling a greener, fairer, stronger Britain and highlights the primary ambitions of the partnership. 
which align to the economic growth aspirations of Newport. As a global gateway, there's huge potential here to deliver a strategy which focuses on trade investment, the role of the ports and airports and the visitor economy. So there's great opportunity here. I'd also like to highlight um, the strength of this particular um, area in terms of innovation. We've got 10 universities and a number of specialist academies and centres. Here in Newport, our cyber and software academies are considered key features of the innovation offer. So Newport is playing a key role in this already and there's an opportunity to develop this further in future. And um, we've our work has been highlighted along with other innovation centres, um, such as the work that is happening in Cheltenham and Gloucester and Swindon. So across the region, the, um, the, the research and development the activity that's going on is, is really important in terms of underpinning that vital growth. And there are great, great opportunities there for us. So work is currently underway in relation to the governance structure of the partnership and um, the group are working towards formalising the partnership through the creation of a partnership board and advisory groups. And these groups are supported by a dedicated secretariat. What I think is a particular strength of, of this uh, partnership is that uh, we've appointed an independent chair. So we've appointed Catherine Bennett from Airbus and Catherine is already leading discussions with UK government on the benefits of the Western Gateway region. And only yesterday afternoon, I attended a, a meeting on behalf of, of Newport and had an opportunity as one of the um, leaders of the partner authorities to um, make representation to uh, the minister from um, the Department for Local Government and Communities and also the Deputy Secretary of State for Wales. So that this is these discussions are ongoing and um, it really is making progress. I'd also like to highlight that the, um, an all party parliamentary group has been established to support the activity of the Western Gateway as well. And I'm really proud to um, share with you that our MP for Newport East, Jessica Morden, is the co-chair of the all party parliamentary group. And uh, Baroness Wilcox, who is a front bench spokesperson for local government in the House of Lords, is also one of the vice chairs of this group. So I'm really pleased to say that within this partnership and within those um, ambassadors who are championing the role of the Western Gateway, Newport is very, very well represented. So I'm really pleased about that as well. I'd like to highlight as well that an independent economic review has also been commissioned and this will really help us in providing the evidence base for future policy development and investment and I'm sure you'd all agree that there is an urgency now for investment um, particularly in the face of the economic downturn that we know we'll be experiencing as a result of COVID-19. So there are great opportunities um, for, for us here. And again, there is an opportunity for investment in infrastructure, particularly across the whole of the region. So overall, colleagues, uh, the Western Gateway does provide Newport with an opportunity. It's an opportunity to be part of a strong strategic partnership, which will help our businesses and industries collaborate and share innovation on a regional basis. Achieving these benefits on our own would be impossible, but through partnership working, greater opportunities arise and our economic growth ambitions become far more achievable and realistic. So um, I'm very proud of the place that we've got within this in the same way that I'm really proud of the, the development and the place that we've got within the Cardiff Capital Region as well. So the report today is just for your information, colleagues, but I hope you agree it's important that Newport is part of the opportunity. And I look forward, as I'm sure you do, in seeing where this can take us on our own journey to economic recovery. 
So I'm pleased to share that information with you and you've had an opportunity to read the report. Councillor Mayer, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Leader. Uh, it, it, it's, um, it's a really creative and sideways thinking initiative and, and one I know that has uh, been very common in Europe, but not so much here. Um, and it is about taking our control of our areas ourselves. So I, 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 I really welcome this. I think it could it could um, it could be really fruitful for, for us and for the whole of this region because all you know, the population from Swansea, Cardiff, Newport, that's where all the Welsh people certainly live. But I was looking at the map leader and it, it uh, I had a flashback to the late 80s and early 90s when our late MP Paul Flynn was campaigning for not, not just a barrage, but a barrage that would um, would allow the the the, um, the natural flow of the river, but would also provide power. And he showed me an illustration from about 1880 that the Victorians proposed, and it was, I believe, I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty certain it was between Cardiff and Western Supermare. It was a roadway along the top and a series of turbines that would uh, provide power during the day, but also pump water up to hillside reservoirs. So during the night, they would let them roll back down. So you'd have dual power there, you know, and with the technology we have today, we could easily do that, you know, so that may be something that they, they would consider because that, that would really tie in this region. Um, and it would cause <laughs> solve some of our local problems in terms of transport. So thank you. Lydia. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Mayor. What I I I would highlight is that um, the the partners are very focused on a green recovery and um, the opportunities that do lie within the region. And and you are absolutely right. Where as a as a economic area, we are pretty unique in in our natural assets. And there are opportunities here to develop them further. And I think that highlights um, the importance of the independent economic review that's been commissioned. And, and I really look forward to us receiving the findings of that and uh, developing the evidence base for investment going forward. So, so thank you for your comments. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Leader. Uh, just a, um, a small comment, really, and just to support yourself and um, Councillor Mayor. I think I probably have a personal vested interest in that, in that I have very close members of my family living in Swansea, Bath, Bristol and um, Cheltenham, which means if, 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 you know, going forward, the connectivity, the promise of a golden ticket and travel between these areas would mean that as a family we certainly benefit from that. But what I think is important to consider is the opportunities to provide um, our, our, our youth, our, those, those young people newly, freshly out of school who are looking for employment, and especially our graduates looking for employment and the job opportunities that will, that will come about from the ease of travel through the Western Gateway region. And it will simply be beneficial, especially as we have to be mindful of the fact that looking already at the figures in relation to the impact and job losses, uh, from COVID-19, the greatest job losses, losses has been within within that that sphere of um, the workforce. So we really, really need to work hard to make sure there's long term investments and prospects for them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis, and, and you highlight there some really important elements of this um, going forward. So, as I said, colleagues, that report is for um, information. And um, we will continue to regularly update and share information on that very important partnership going forward. Are members content with the report? Okay, thank you all um, for your support. The next item on our agenda is um, item 10, Strategic Recovery Aims, Governance and Democratic uh, Arrangements. This is on these. This can be found on pages 129 to 150 
of um, your report pack. Colleagues, um, you will recall that at our last cabinet meeting on the 24th of June, we agreed a number of strategic recovery aims which will unpin, underpin our corporate priorities as we move into the recovery phase following the relaxation of the COVID-19 restrictions. One of these commitments was to ensure that we introduced revised governance and democratic arrangements as soon as possible to facilitate the commencement of remote meetings. This recognised that for the immediate future, we need to change the way in which we operate and there is a continuing need for members to participate remotely in democratic decision making processes. As an administration, we've always been fully committed to a democratic decision making process, which is open, transparent and publicly accountable. However, the immediate COVID-19 lockdown meant that all formal committee meetings needed to be suspended in March and these decisions taken under member and officer schemes of delegation. This certainly did not mean that there's been a lack of transparency or that delegated decisions taken during this period have not been capable of scrutiny and challenge. All councillors have continued to be consulted in writing on all cabinet member reports and written reports on planning and licensing decisions. In addition, members have been able to submit written questions at any time, particularly in relation to COVID related matters. However, in the interest of open government, we have always been mindful of the need to recommence meetings once the law was changed to permit this to be done safely and remotely. We've endeavoured to do this in a pragmatic and phased manner, with the emphasis being on getting this right rather than rushing to arrange virtual meetings quickly. So you will recall colleagues um, at our last meeting, we called for a further report with proposals for the phased introduction of remote council meetings, recommended protocols and procedures for the conduct and management of these meetings, and critically, a training and development programme for members to ensure that they are able to participate fully within these revised governance arrangements. The report we have before us today sets out this pro these proposals and Cabinet is asked to approve and endorse the revised governance and democratic arrangements and the proposed protocol for the conduct of remote meeting. Although this is intended to apply during the immediate COVID-19 recovery period, we recognise that there will be a continuing need for the flexibility provided by remote meetings in terms of meeting the local government equalities and diversities agenda. Therefore, these procedures will be kept under review and re-evaluated. We we'll look to refine and improve the remote arrangements where appropriate and we'll continue to look at further enhancements in technology. Colleagues, our previous remote cabinet meeting in June was the first step along the way. That meeting was recorded and has been uploaded to the Council website for the public to view. This meeting today is our next step as it is being broadcast live. The press and public are able to click on the link published with the cabinet agenda to view these proceedings via the live stream. This technology can be rolled out to other council and committee meetings. The Forward Work programme proposes that we hold a remote full council AGM on the 28th of July to deal with statutory appointments. We will then use the August recess to plan for the recommencement of planning and licensing committees as from September, together with scrutiny meeting, committee meetings in September and October. However, the success of remote meetings is not just dependent on the technology, but the ability of members to participate effectively in those meetings. Therefore, member training and development will be critical to the success of these revised governance arrangements. And I would urge all councillors to undertake this training as soon as possible 
and engaged fully in the training sessions that are being organised by the governance and IT support teams. The member training process has already started in readiness for the AGM. Councillors will have received emails from the governance team leader with instructions about how they can access these Microsoft Teams live events from their laptops and guidance notes on how to use the speaking and voting applications. A number of remote training sessions have been set up this week and appointments have been sent to members so that they can participate in some practical demonstrations before the court formal meetings commence. We'll then use the August period to provide further member training tailored to particular needs and for specific committees such as planning and licensing where there'll be further complexities due to the need for public part participation in the meetings. Finally, Although the Council does not need to formally amend its current standing orders to allow for these remote meetings to take place, it is recommended that a protocol should be agreed for the conduct of remote meetings to ensure fairness and consistency and to provide guidelines for participants regarding procedures, etiquette and conduct. A suggested protocol and procedure is set out at Appendix 2 to the report. If Cabinet is content with the protocol, then it's suggested that we recommend to Council that it be formally adopted at the AGM as part of the Constitution until the 1st of May 2021, which is when the remote meetings regulations expire, or such earlier time as the Council may decide. Colleagues, I'm happy to move the acceptance of these revised governance and democratic arrangements and to recommend to Council that the proposed protocol is adopted as a variation to standing order. Does anyone wish to make any comments? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, just a quick comment from me. If anyone is under the illusion that work has stopped on the Council because the Civic Centre is closed, then they are really, really deluded. Work has intensified, it hasn't laid back. And in fairness to yourself, we have had updates on a regular basis throughout all of this. And anyone can pick up the phone and speak to you if they feel they haven't had enough information. We have been swamped with it. So I really am a little bit confused by this, but I'm glad we're putting it in the, the orders. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Mayor. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Leader. I, I mean, it's, it's good news. I'd just like to add some some colour to this, if I if I may. I attended um, an SRS board yesterday and, the, and they gave us some data on um, the usage of teams, which is what we're using and will be using to communicate with full council next week and with cabinet today um it, it wasn't until around january we started to roll this out but we did roll it up and um in jan in march and april i think we were way ahead of everyone else at newport they picked it up and and uh, and used it immediately um in gwent in may and june there were fifty one thousand teams meetings between mostly officers, occasional cabinet meetings, but mostly officers. And in Newport alone, there were 13,000 Teams meetings and 151,000 messages via Teams because um, officers were using this remotely to communicate information um, in their lockdown situation. So it's um, it, it'll be great when we get back to uh, uh, a full democratic um, service, but the council has continued and we have been at the helm of it all the way through, which is really good news. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor, and thank you for that um, statistical information. That's really helpful in um, to us. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Leader. I just wanted to comment on the fact that as, as a cabinet, we've already focused on and looked at um, the strategic my words out, strategic recovery program post COVID. 
and I welcome the fact that we are now going to, the chairs of the scrutiny committees are now going to meet throughout August, obviously virtually, to determine the new work, revise their work pro programme so they can actually scrutinise effectively and ensure there's true transparency in regard to the decisions that we are taking for our residents in Newport to ensure that we move safely out of this difficult, difficult pandemic that we're presently in. Thank you. Thank you. Would any would colleagues like to make any further comments on the report? No. Um, so in which case, colleagues, I'm happy to move the acceptance of the revised governance and democratic arrangements. Are you content to support this? Yeah. OK, um, thank you very much for that, colleagues. Move then to item 11 on our agenda today. So we've had a very full agenda and a lot of information to um, look at. And I don't want to use the cliche of saving the best till last, but I'm actually really proud of this piece of work and the work the colleagues have, have put into this. So. Um, as the leader of the City Council, I'm really pleased to be able to present to Cabinet our, the Authority's third strategic equality plan. And the equality plan, the report on the plan is on pages 151 to 196 of your agenda packs. The strategy represents an evolution from our 2016 to 2020 plan. It's got more outcome based objectives that have been developed by working closely in partnership with various teams across the authority and in collaboration with key stakeholders and communities. And, and for me personally, that's a really important element of this. So this has been very much um, a piece of work that really has embraced co-production. So I'm, I'm very proud of this. The equality objectives within the Strategic Equality Plan have a good mix of internally focused objectives such as our commitment to improving our workforce diversity through greater positive action and more externally focused objectives, such as our ongoing commitment to improving com community cohesion across the city. This balance of internal self-reflection and an outwardly focused commitment to improving equality in key areas of our society is the strength of this strategy. And I'm confident that it represents a positive step forward for Newport City Council. The past few months, and no doubt that in the next few months to come, have been challenging and have exposed many of the structural and social inequalities that continue to persist in our society. From the global Black Lives Matter protests to our exit from the European Union and, of course, the ramifications of the global COVID-19 pandemic. We find ourselves at a societal crossroads as we look to recover and learn from events that have touched us all, but have impacted specific groups in our communities so acutely. I'd like to um, just highlight there um, when we're starting to consider this and starting to think about this and um, some of the responses that we're also developing as well. So just to share with you colleagues that I've had an opportunity to um, rep meet with representatives from the black and minority ethnic community here in Newport and some of the groups um, that represent individuals and communities within that to discuss the um, the Black Lives Matter movement and we'll be having a further meeting with them to discuss their, their manifesto, so the areas that they highlight um, 
where they would like to see change going forward. And we continue to work on a collaborative partnership basis with representatives of, of some of these groups to take some of this forward. And what I'd really like to emphasize there in terms of Newport. So um, we, we're really proud that we had an excellent uh, March here in Newport, which was well organized and well supervised. But let me make it absolutely clear in relation to those issues. It doesn't end with the March. The March was simply the beginning. The actions that follow on from that will be all important. And I will make it absolutely clear on this public platform that Newport City Council is committed to taking some actions forward in relation to that. However, whilst we remain committed to that and to our strategy, many of our challenges do remain the same. We absolutely must continue to strive to deliver equitable public services for all of our residents in the face of an increasingly challenging economic backdrop. And we must do this while not allowing the forces of division to create an environment of intolerance and hostility between us. I believe and, and I do truly believe that this strategy will help us to achieve this aim. I move for the adoption of this strategy and in doing so, I'd like to thank both the Cabinet Member for Community and Resources, Councillor David Mayer, and Councillor Mark Whitkirk for their contributions to the plan and the Strategic Equality Group over the past four years. So, so they've, they've been key agents for change in terms of this piece of work and developing this. So thank you both um, David and Mark for the role that you've played within this. So before um, we go on to um, comment and vote, on the plan, I'd just like to um, invite David as a cabinet member to speak. Th thank you, Jochen Wahl, leader. Um, you summed it up beautifully there, uh, the importance and significance of, of this paper. Um, I'd just like to add that politically, we were way ahead of the curve in terms of equality at Newport. Um, our 2012 manifesto was you remember because it was your first election, we highlighted our intention to address inequality and to appoint a famous commissioner. This was way in advance of the Welsh Government's announcements of the Strategic Equalities Plan in 2012, which uh, this now has become uh, its fruition. Um, and, and this paved the way for equality, equality to be integrated in all our services. The Senate, by the way, was the first UK government to introduce an equalities plan. The plans continue to evolve, as you quite rightly mentioned. The pandemic has highlighted problems we already identified and brought them very per firmly into the public eye. We are not reactive at Newport. We have a marvellous team here. They are fully aware of our political commitment to equality. And this gives them the confidence, I believe, to go above and beyond the call of duty. The Equalities team work hard to embed practice throughout the authority, so it's not just a tick box exercise. They also interpret it and present it in an easy to read document. And that's one of the highlights of this. We moved a million miles away from council speak that we used to have that most people couldn't even understand to something that is readable and accessible. Um, so thanks to all the team for that and thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Councillor Rana. Thank you, uh, Leader. I just want to echo what you and uh, Councillor Mayor have already said, to be honest with you. It's a really um, important piece of work in light of um, what this pandemic has um, uncovered, I'm afraid. It's exposed, as you say, the structural and socioeconomic in inequalities in our society. Those that are really badly affected by poverty have been affected by COVID-19, I'm afraid. And that shows amongst the communities that I and obviously all of us live in, where 
we've seen those that are on the breadline have unfortunately contracted uh, COVID-19 because not because of any genetic reason, but because they had were forced to go out and work. Because for them, it was either um, get paid and um, feed their family or stay home and not feed at all and not eat at all. And that is something that is shocking that should not be happening um, in 2020, in the 21st century. And it, it goes to show that there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, throughout the country, not just in Newport. But I just want to mention as well, I, I was involved in the Welsh Government Task Force in looking at the socioeconomic links um, between COVID-19 deaths in, in the BAME community. And I can wholeheartedly say that this um, equality plan is going above and beyond what was discussed at Welsh Government level. As Councillor Mayor said, we are ahead of the curve again. We've gone, um, you know, uh, ahead of Welsh Government in getting this plan together. And the reason for that is we've had really good officers involved from the very beginning with our grassroots BME community. But it's important also to highlight it isn't all about BME community. It's also about the disability um, that our not only our employees but our residents uh, have to live with. It's also about the LGBTQ plus community as well. And what better way to show leadership um, than with this authority taking the lead in setting up support networks for those groups and for those people who uh, really need their voices to be heard right now. Um, so again, what Councillor Harvey said earlier, it, it, I can't imagine anyone who would think that we've been sitting and not doing anything at all. These last few months, it's been absolutely outstanding the amount of work the officers have done, what you have done, Leader, and what this cabinet are doing still, to, um, you know. And we've had this wartime coalition between the opposition leader and yourself. It's been respectable up to a certain point. It's a shame we can't continue, but we have to move forward. But I just want to say leadership is really important, and you've taken the lead on this, and the council have taken the lead, and it's brilliant to see this uh, report and so so soon after um you know the lockdowns ended so well done to everyone involved thank you councillor Rahman, and and thank you on behalf of the city for the work that you've done with with the task force that is a really important report and um we really thank you for the contributions that, that you continue to make to that um councillor giles Thank you, Leader. Um, I just want to take the opportunity really to um, uh, thank everybody in association with work with the Youth Council and the Youth Council themselves, because I understand they've been so active and they've really stepped up to the plate, these young people. It's, they have they've worked non-stop. I mean, they've had a campaign, they've done online activities to support young people, they're helping them with, um, you know, uh, emotional well-being, um, and other activities to keep them busy and I understand they've also been involved in the uh, community impact um, assessment that the council has undertaken so really it's it's a wonderful story and where we talk about um, you know our community but these young people uh, Newport young people um, we can be very proud of them and they can be very proud of themselves for what they've done and I'd like to thank them for that. Thank you, Councillor Giles, and, and, I, and I, I, I echo your thanks. Um, they, they are an outstanding group uh, uh, of young people with, with a genuine passion and commitment. And I was actually really proud to um, participate in, their, in their, some of their lockdown campaigns myself and engage, engage with them on that. And I look forward to continued engagement. So thank you very much for those comments. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Leader. I'd like to certainly support and endorse every single comment that my colleagues have, have made so far. But I, what I wanted to say was it's not just seeing that our officers are reacting and responding um, to the COVID crisis and, and taking into consideration the equalities as a consequence of that. What we are being presented with is an evidence-based approach. 
um, the information that we've been presented with. I've got I've got detailed now a draft report that will be published soon on the socio-economic impact of the COVID crisis on our residents, and, and specifically in relation to poverty, inequality, and health and health, which is it shows as an in-depth approach, evidence approach and evidence-based approach, and it will ensure that um, there'll be specific actions in the future, and we welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Cochrane. Yeah, j just following on from that, Leader, um, I think people need to be aware that I was talking to Sally the other day, and we've had a, a nearly a third increase in safeguarding of children, and domestic abuse is really on the rise. So, you know, I, I know we haven't talked about that today, about the, the, the impact of that financially, but what is impacting on those families? Because obviously social workers have got to go out there, they've got to assess these families now with all these children would be important to safeguard. So it's, it's a real issue and, uh, and, I, and I don't know where we're going to go with it, to be perfectly honest, because it is, it is a worrying trend now, certainly in urban areas of safeguarding with children. They haven't got the luxury of some of them in high rise flats, you know, all locked up there basically with children it's 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 heartbreaking to be honest thank you councillor cochran and, and you highlight there you know some of the important aspects that we will really need to address um in future so colleagues i, I thank you for your comments on the strategic equality plan um i'm happy to um, move the adoption of the strategy and members um happy to support that OK, that's great. Thank you very much um, for your contributions there. The next item on our agenda is a standing item. There is the work programme. And as we are um, moving back to business, shall we say, um, the work programme is still under uh, development. So uh, we, we will have more work on that as, as we go through. And that brings our meeting today, our first virtual. Um, live cabinet meeting of Newport City Council uh, to a close. Members, I'd like to thank you for your um, participation today, for your comments and your contributions. I'd particularly like to thank the officers that have joined us and our democratic services teams and our IT teams that have made this possible. So thank you everyone. Thank you for your efforts. I, I appreciate um, that you've all put a lot of work into this and, and um, I don't think the public realise how much effort and work you've put in behind the scenes. So thank you very much for making this a really relatively seamless process and supporting us in our use of technology as well. So thank you all. Um, thank you all colleagues. And um, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. I draw this meeting to a close. Thank you.